listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, award-winning volunteer and chapter leadership committee member of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Cindy. Hello again. This is episode 105 of Lighthearted, slated for February 17th, 2021. This is part two of two parts. In episode 104, we spoke with Alani Bruton, whose father, Jim Bruton, was keeper at a few light stations in British Columbia, Canada, including 18 years at Sheringham Point. Today, we'll be talking with John Walls and Rebecca Quinn about the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Preservation Society, and also Rebecca's book about the history of the light station. Cindy, let's start by telling a little of the history of Sheringham Point Lighthouse. Sure, Jeremy. Sheringham Point in the community of Shirley is about 16 miles northwest of Race Rocks near the south end of Vancouver Island. It was named in 1846 for the British Vice Admiral William Lewis Sheringham of the Royal Navy. The wreck of the steamer Valencia nearby in 1906, with the loss of at least 126 lives, had put pressure on the Canadian government to improve navigation. To aid shipping along the Canadian side of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, A light station was established at Sheringham Point in 1912. A 64-foot tall hexagonal reinforced concrete tower was built along with the dwelling and outbuildings. A flashing white light shone from a third-order Fresnel lens rotating on a bed of mercury. It was 72 feet above the water and the light was visible for 14 miles. The station began operation on September 30, 1912. The first keeper was Eustace Arden, who remained in charge for 34 years. The station was very isolated in its early days, and a lighthouse tender delivered supplies every few months. Keeper Fred Mountain died at the station in 1968. His successor, Jim Bruton, served until 1986, and the station was de-staffed a short time later. The Sheringham Point Lighthouse Preservation Society was formed in 2003 to preserve the remaining structures and to ensure that the site remains accessible to visitors. Much of the surrounding land is now privately owned. We have two guests today. First, we'll hear from John Walls, Vice President of the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Preservation Society. After that is an interview with Rebecca Quinn, who's written a new book about the history of the light station. John Walls is the author of a book called Celebrating Victoria about one of Canada's most beautiful cities. And in 2015, he co-authored with Pete Johnson the book To the Lighthouse, an explorer's guide to the island lighthouses of southwestern BC. He lives in the community of Shirley, and he's an avid kayaking buff. I spoke with John Walls last month. Let's listen to that conversation now. Speaking today with John Walls, who's the vice president of the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Preservation Society, and I understand he lives, tells me, within a kilometer of uh, the Sheringham Point Lighthouse. And uh, what does that translate into uh, in miles? 0.62. The easy way to do it is figure a half because you're close enough. Yeah. Right. Okay. About a half mile. Yeah. I used to know that, but I forgot. So it's great to have you with me today, John. I really appreciate it. Great to be with you too, Jeremy. We're going to talk, of course, about the Lighthouse and the Society, but I just want to start by talking a little bit about your personal involvement. How did you come to be involved with the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Society? I can't remember the date, but it was somewhere around in 05, uh, 2005, when uh, a gentleman named Michael Galizio uh, knocked on my door, introduced himself, and said he was the president of the Society, and that there was a meeting that Saturday, and he invited me to come. And uh, that's how it all started. It was a knock on the door. Were lighthouses on your radar before you, well, you must have been familiar with the Sheringham Point Lighthouse, but lighthouses in general, uh, were you kind of a lighthouse aficionado before you got involved? An aficionado is a very good term. I've been always fascinated with the mystique of lighthouses. They're iconic symbols, they're historic, and they're just awesome buildings, and they've made a difference uh, throughout time. So let's talk about, specifically about Sheringham Point Lighthouse. There is, as I understand it, some ongoing preservation happening. Before we talk about that, I just wanted to mention to you, I visited Sheringham Point Lighthouse five years ago during a a trip where I drove from uh, San Diego, California, up the entire West Coast and took a ferry to Victoria and saw about 15 BC lighthouses. 
it is a, a beautiful spot there. So I just wanted you to know that I've actually been there. That's it's fantastic, in, Jeremy. So as I said, there's been some uh, preservation going on at the lighthouse, and I'm just wondering if you could tell us what's been accomplished so far. The main person involved, as far as the financial backing, is a gentleman named Peter Westaway. Uh, his wife, Brigetta, they have the Westaway Foundation. He's actually from Toronto. And as of now, I don't have the exact number, but he's donated through his foundation up to $400,000, which has come down to the highest donation from a private individual to a lighthouse in Canada. Wow. Yeah, we got a, a check from him, I think around 2013, for $1,000. It was just like, just out of the blue in the mail. Here's $1,000, nothing attached to it. And so naturally, we wanted to research it. And uh, he ended up coming out, and we ended up going to dinner and having uh, dinner and wine and tours to the lighthouse. And that's how it all started with Peter. And he wow. lived in a lighthouse in uh, outside of Toronto that he's renovated. Do you know which lighthouse that is? It's Long Point. It's oh, on okay. Lake Erie. Just south of him would be, of course, uh, upstate New York. So that, that's amazing. There's a lot of lighthouse groups in the U.S. who would love to get that kind of donation. Specifically, what's what's been done so far? There's sort of an isthmus out to the lighthouse, and on both sides from, from West Coast storms, that we and we just had a big one recently, it was, there was some serious erosion. So the first thing we did was shore that in. One side got a new wall, and the other got boulders, and that shored it up so we wouldn't have a lighthouse on a little island out there. So that was the first thing we've done. The major stuff that's been done is the painting of the lighthouse and the restoration of the lantern room, uh, the glass panels. They were they were shot out from people in boats with shotguns. It was just a mess. The place was in a state of atrophy. We had the lighthouse painted, and we've had a trail built to get down there as well. There's a regular road that you can walk, but now we've got a trail just about completed. So the restoration of the outside of the lighthouse the shoring up, and now the trail. Those are three of the, the major things that we've gotten done. That's fantastic. And what major things remain to be done? Well, there's one major, and uh, we're not sure exactly what option it's going to be. And it, it is the what, what makes a lighthouse iconic, the light. In the lantern room, there is no light. So from the Souk Region Museum, which is a, uh, uh, Souk is a local town near Shirley, mm -hmm. they had the foghorn, and the uh, Third Order Fresnel and other uh, artifacts from the lighthouse since 86. And uh, we were able to get them back on a permanent loan, so to speak. I, I know that sounds a little oxymoronic, but that was how they put it, So, which was great. But the Fresnel lens is, in, uh, is all apart, and uh, we need some help from someone as far as rebuilding it. And the other option is putting in the DCB Krauss Heinz lens, which was a secondary lens after the third order for now was taken down. So we need to reinstall the light in the, in, in the lantern room. And that would be sort of the icing on the cake, so to speak. Absolutely. I visited the Souk Region Museum when I was out there, too. Enjoyed, enjoyed that visit. You saw the tower that's there then, Jeremy. Yes. And that tower came out uh, off a, a huge light off of Triangle Island. First order in there, by the way. Yes. Beautiful lens. Yes. And what happened with the fog that's up there, that's very North Island off North uh, Vancouver Island. The fog's so bad that the lighthouse was above the fog. So it was of no use. That's why that's there. Oh, that was a, a really beautiful lens. Now the uh, Sheringham Point lens has is, is been in storage there. Yes, but we have it now. We've, we you have, it, we now. have it in our storage area and the foghorn and other artifacts. So you mentioned the trail earlier. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else uh, on the agenda that might improve the, the site for visitors in any way? Well, our whole mission is to make the site, which contains five acres, Jeremy. So it's five acres and the, the, the lighthouse, a passive park. So it's for people to enjoy. It's a natural setting. We're not going to change it. We're just going to keep it maintained. And that's that's the maintenance of it and stuff is is, is very costly and keeping it open every day for visitors. But it, it's rewarding to us. Mm -hmm. Sure is a, a beautiful area. I saw on your website for the, the Lighthouse Society that there's a, an educational school program. 
called yes. uh, Exploring the Lighthouse. I was impressed by what I saw in that. Uh, not that many lighthouse organizations have developed, you know, educational materials to that extent. Could you say a little bit about what that program's all about? I sure can. We call it the Ambassador Program as well. Ian Fawcett, who's he was one of the main people involved with the restoration project, working with the contractors. He started it, and we work with the middle school in uh, in Souk. And uh, they come out for uh, almost a full day visit, and they take photos, and then they write stories about their experience at the lighthouse. And we got an award from the International National Trust Meetings, and it was an award of excellence for uh, involving the schools at the lighthouse. That's fantastic. I I can tell you this, Jeremy, that I've been down there and had the opportunity to be down there when the kids are there. And it's just amazing to see what they're running around and they're taking photos and they're just all excited. And it's, it, it really does mean something and it's a great learning experience for them. Oh, I'm sure that's, that's really good. It's so important to get kids involved in these places and get local kids interested in local history. And it's not just the history of the lighthouse, but it's the natural environment as well, of course. And speaking of history, just uh, to go to the beginning, Sheringham was built 1912. So we just, not that far back, uh, celebrated our 100th uh, anniversary. Mm -hmm. But these lighthouses on the west coast of British Columbia went up fast when the Valencia tragedy happened. The Valencia, the ship that left San Francisco, missed the Juan de Fuca coming into Victoria and ended up in the rocks north of uh, Port Renfrew. Such a, a 136 lost their lives in that tragedy. It was mostly women and children that did. Yeah. Some of the men did get get out of it. The um, the Canadian government put a mandate out to build these lighthouses. And that's where Sheringham came from, from the Valencia. Tomorrow, I'm, I'm going to be talking with uh, Rebecca Quinn, who I believe is uh, the historian for your organization. Uh-huh. And she uh, wrote the book on Sheringham Point Lighthouse. She so. did. And uh, it's really, really nice uh, little book. A really good job was was done on that. I know she did a lot of it, but other, probably you and and other people with the society were were very involved in that too. We all yeah. were. And Rebecca did a spectacular job. The book is is just recently got out into the retail sector, and it's selling well. Good, good. I've got my copy right next to me here, and I, I really did enjoy that. Another thing uh, that I discovered when I was researching your lighthouse is that uh, the society is involved with a whale monitoring program. Can you explain that? Yes. Vancouver Island, uh, Puget Sound, Seattle, Washington, that area, it's all called now the Sailor Sea. And out here, we have three resident pods, J, K, and L pods. Uh, right now, we have around 78 orchids in those three pods. Mm. And where Sheringham Lighthouse is on the Wanda Fuca Strait in the Salish Sea is a quarter for the orcas as they're um, they're feeding. And they feed only on salmon. They don't, they're not carnivores as far as whales or seals and things like that. These are residents, orcas, and they just feed on uh, basically salmon. And Chinook is at the top of their diet. I was disappointed when I was out there. I didn't see any orcas. Uh, I took a a cruise from Victoria that was supposed to be a, an orca spotting cruise, but maybe I was there the wrong time of year. It was late spring or it was May. It was May when I was there. Really, the peak for whale watching for orcas is July and August, and especially August, because that's when the salmon are coming out of the ocean into the straits to go up the rivers to spawn. And so that's where they're really feeding like crazy. I've Very actually good. been out there in my kayak uh, and surrounded by them, and they're amazing creatures. Oh, I'm sure. I've seen them in uh, captivity, but I'd like to see them in the wild. So, John, you were involved in a book called To the Lighthouse, which I also have right next to me here. And it came out, I believe, just after I visited BC in 2015. I wish I had it when I was there. It would have been extremely helpful. What was your role in the creation of that book? Well, it was an idea I had to, uh, to raise funds for the society. And uh, I thought that just centering on Sheringham wouldn't give it the marketing appeal that a lighthouse book needed. So we included 24 other lighthouses around Vancouver Island. I should mention the the entire title is To the Lighthouse, an Explorer's Guide to the Island Lighthouses of Southwestern BC. There's a lot of beautiful photographs in it. I see that photo- photography was by Richard Paddle. It's a very nicely put together book. I'd recommend it to anybody going to that area or even just people who might vicariously want to go to that area. 
a lot of good information, a lot of great photos. I do want to mention Peter Johnson, who's written other and won awards for his historic writing in British Columbia. He was an amazing man to work with. I learned so much from him and he just did a fantastic job. Each lighthouse has um, a rating one to five getting there. And each lighthouse uh, featured in the book had stories on keepers, shipwrecks, ghost stories, and what have you. So it's, uh, it's, it's a terrific book and it's done very well. It is. Sounds like you had a really good team with you and Peter Johnson and uh, Richard Paddle, the photographer. The uh, cover picture of Sheringham Point you took from a kayak, is that right? That's correct. And I understand you're an avid kayaker and you're in a good area to do it. In a perfect area. Just right there, I launch out and uh, the whole world's my oyster out there. I just, it's just a, a beautiful feeling to be out there with one in nature on a kayak out here. I'll bet it is. Have you ever been in the middle of a pod of uh, orca while kayaking? I have. And it's amazing. I actually had one and it's, he's called Big Mike. He's J26, I believe. And he actually pushed my kayak with his nose. <laughs> Just playing, I guess. It was scary, to be honest. With you. <laughs> I'll bet it was. <laughs> They're large animals. They're massive. They make you feel very small in the kayak. Yeah, it had to be a little unnerving. It was. Uh, but also exciting. Yes. All, yeah. all of the above. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Another really big subject for this lighthouse, one that you see in pretty much all the articles to do with it, it seems to be always mentioned. I also discussed this when I spoke the other day with Alani Bruton, the keeper's daughter. Uh, and so I have to ask you about this. What's your take on uh, whether or not the lighthouse is haunted? Well, I, I, you know, I'm kind of a skeptic with that paranormal stuff, but on this one, there's, you know, the stories of Alani who I've known for a number of years and I just respect her opinion so much. Some of the stories that she's mentioned and experiences from the lighthouse, but here's the wild one. You have the Sheringham book that Rebecca Quinn just did. I'm going to hold it up and show you something. See mm -hmm. this light here that's on where my finger is on the, on the uh, tower, mid tower. Yeah. There is no light behind. This is a long exposure photograph. Mm. There's no, this, no light source clean. that would be casting that. There's no ambient light where this lighthouse is, Jeremy. It is in a very, very remote rural spot. There is no, yeah. and to the, to looking at it to the left of the lighthouse, that's the Milky Way. Yeah. Uh, just so people listening know, we're actually doing this interview via Zoom so we can see each other. Of course, people listening will just hear the audio, but if you get the book, Sheringham, A Canadian Heritage Story, you'll see the picture we're talking about. I'm looking at it right now, and there's a kind of a almost blurry type of uh, light hitting the middle of the lighthouse tower, and uh, that's really interesting that there was no no apparent light source that would cause that. Is that picture online, like on the, the Society's website or anything like I, that? It should be. It should be. I, I, I haven't been on, uh, on the site just recently, but it should be up. Okay. If not, I'll make sure it is. Okay, great. So, of course, the keeper's houses are gone now. And uh, Alani had her and her uh, other family members had their experiences in, in one of the keeper's houses that used to stand there. So I don't know if the ghost would have migrated to the lighthouse tower once the other buildings were gone. Has anybody had an ex any experiences that you know of besides this picture in recent years? Not that I know of, but this this picture does make your hair stand up on it when you, <laughs> when you think about it. Because behind there, it's completely dark, Jeremy. Yeah. No light. That is extremely interesting. You kind of touched on the value of lighthouses in our world, our society earlier, but why does Sheringham Point Lighthouse need to be preserved? Well, when I think about a question like that, I think about the pyramids and other things that are so iconic. And again, so much a part of our history and our heritage that they need to stand. And when the society fought for years for to save it, it was a struggle. It was a political struggle. And we started in 03 and we actually got ownership in 2015. So it was a long haul. And it was, we were all together because we had one goal in mind was to, was to get ownership and preserve it. And now it's preserved for visitors and locals to enjoy for years to come. That's fantastic. Congratulations on all that's been done there already. And uh, I'm sure it's going to just continue to, to get better and better. So I have one more question for you for bonus points. 
what is your favorite part of your involvement with the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Society? Well, it's kind of two pronged. Um, as I mentioned, the years fighting, that was everybody was together pushing in one direction. And it was a lot of fun. And then it's almost like your parents and you have the baby and it's so much excitement and you're all working for it. Then you have the baby and you go, oh my God, what a responsibility. And then it flips to we're property managers. <laughs> so we went from an advocacy group to property managers. And it is really a dichotomy. But as far as my favorite part, my favorite part is very personal. When I go to the site and I see people walking up past me with smiles on their face and I interview them and I say, how was your experience? And, and, and they just love it. And they're, they're all excited and they're enthusiastic. And they're from, where are you from? I'm from Australia. I'm, most of them are from the States, mostly American. Mm -hmm. And they just love to come to the site. And that to me is the most rewarding and favorite part of my whole involvement is that aspect. I can understand that. I think a lot of us involved with lighthouses uh, feel the same way that, you know, sharing that, the, the place itself and the history with, with visitors from all over, it's uh, pretty special. John Walls, uh, Vice President of the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Preservation Society. I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me today. It's a pleasure talking with you. And, you know, again, uh, congratulations on everything that's been accomplished there. And I wish you good fortune uh, with uh, the things you have planned in the future. Thank you so much, John. Well, Jeremy, this was terrific. And if you do make it back out, I'll give you a personal tour up to the lighthouse and inside and up. And if I come out, I'd, I'd hope to get a look inside your Portsmouth beautiful lighthouse as well. It's a deal. Absolutely. If you make it out here, please let me know. You'll get a, a tour of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. So again, thanks so much, John. Okay. Next, we'll listen to a conversation with Rebecca Quinn. Rebecca is a PhD student at the University of Warwick in Coventry, England. She was born in Alberta, Canada, and she's been visiting the Sheringham Point Lighthouse every summer since she was seven years old. She considers British Columbia her real home. In 2013, Rebecca was elected to be historian of the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Preservation Society. She worked with society volunteers to create the book Sheringham, a Canadian Heritage Story, which was published last year. I spoke with Rebecca Quinn recently. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking today with Rebecca Quinn, who is the uh, historian for the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Preservation Society and also the author of a, an excellent book that's come out uh, not long ago called Sheringham, a Canadian Heritage Story. It's great to have you with me today, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you so much for a lovely introduction. It's great to be here. <laughs> Before we get into the book and a little bit of history of the lighthouse itself, uh, I'd like to just uh, ask you a couple of questions, you know, related to your background. In your biography in your book, it says you consider British Columbia your real home, although I know you've been going to school in England. You've been visiting the lighthouse since you were seven years old. I'm wondering what's really special to you about that area and about the, the lighthouse itself. Yeah, so I definitely moved around a lot, still do, but I almost always spent my summers up uh, in Shirley, in Souk, and uh, invariably, if it was a lovely day, we'd walk up to the lighthouse, and I've seen it go through multiple iterations of when it was under the Coast Guard's protection, and then as it transferred eventually over to the uh, Preservation Societies. And it's just always been such a neat thing to be able to go and see. And um, as I got more involved with the society, I started to understand the significance that it played to the rest of the community and all of the history that went into it. So it's just continued to grow in importance to me as both just a wonderful place to go and spend an afternoon or in a place to read about. Well, I understand. Everybody should have a lighthouse they can walk to. That's a, <laughs> that's a good thing to have. When you're in BC now, are you still really close to the, the lighthouse? We are. We are just down the road, actually. Oh, excellent. So you still the easy walk. Yeah, yeah, good. So how did you come to be involved with the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Preservation Society? I got involved when I was 16, and that was just sheer luck. I'm a personal friend of the uh, president, Michael Galizio, 
And he was looking for someone to just go through and make a database and compile together all of the uh, historical documents that they had to hand for the lighthouse. And it ended up that I found a lot more than I think either of us was expecting to find. It went from just making a database to making a little blurb that's compiled the history to actually making a full booklet, which was effectively the first iteration of this new book. From there, it just kind of kept going because I found all the stuff and there was, as more records were released from the government, there were there was more stuff to find. Mm -hmm. And so I continued to get involved through writing newspaper articles, made a few promotional videos for them, did lots of oral history interviews, just anything and everything I could find. And I was always tracking down someone in my off time. You're obviously a talented historian and, and writer, researcher. But from your biography, I understand what you study in, I think you're going for a doctorate at this point, is that right? And what you study is nothing to do with uh, history or anything like that. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, I'm studying uh, bacteriophage genetics, which is viruses that attack bacteria. So not remotely related to lighthouses, unfortunately. I've always had a love for history throughout all of my education. And so this just naturally fit. Oh, it shows, you know, your love for, for the history really shows in the book. So you, you've you touched on it, but how exactly did the book come about? Effectively, it was really just, I started out with the documents and stitched it into a Word document that said, you know, this is who was there. And here's an interesting factoid about how the tower came to be, etc. And then as I gathered more things and I found out, you know, oh, there's some documents at the Coast Guard. So I went and got, looked at what the Coast Guard had down in Victoria and so on. And then slowly people from around the community started cropping up that had little bits and pieces of things that could be included. And as that happened, more and more of this story came together. And so that was the original history of the Sheringham Point Lighthouse. And then the one that was just published was about four or five years of additional research that came out and was being released by the government. So I just continued to flesh out everything I could find. I had some more interviews and then started finding, yeah. although all of the original light keepers have passed away, there were quite a few assistant light keepers who were much younger. And so they are still around and I started finding them and sitting down with them for interviews. And then I found there's all these amazing stories that get lost in just government documents. Mm -hmm. And so I just had to include them in this new version. And that's effectively how we get the heritage story out of it. Well, it's beautifully put together. I'm flipping through it as we speak here. And there's so many excellent, you know, really interesting historic photos and more recent photos. It's a, it's a beautifully put together book. Did, did you do the design yourself or did somebody else do that? Actually, it was Noella Ledro did the graphic designing for it. Um, I worked with her and collected all of the photos and we worked together to figure out how things were going to fit together. But in the end, she was the one who pulled it all together. Well, she did a great job and, you know, you definitely had a good team there. It really is nice. You know, uh, there aren't that many lighthouses, even some of the, the really best known, you know, tourist attraction type lighthouses, both in the U.S. and Canada, haven't had anybody put together something like this, this book, you know, for them. So, you know, I, I just uh, really commend you on, on uh, what you did here. It's, it's uh, impressive and nicely done. You just mentioned you have, uh, you talked to some of the, the ex-assistant keepers, but you have quite a bit of material on uh, a lot of the keepers in the history of the, the light station. How did you find that material? Some of them had military records, so that helped to track down as, as certain year marks came up, the government would release the military records. So people like um, Thomas Charles Cross, um, Alfred Dickinson, and Thomas Westhead, for example, they had military records that were accessible from the government files. And then... Some of it was just trolling through old documents that came from um, like immigration records to try and piece through who came from where. And there was just a lot of Googling on it, honestly, and tracking down. I eventually tracked down Fred Mountains and his wife Nellie's grave sites, which I was hoping would give me more information. It did not. Then as I found more assistant keepers, sometimes they had a little bit more insight that I could add to that as well. But yeah, it was a hodgepodge of uh, different locations and sure. things that I found. And of course, you had access to uh, Alani Bruton, whose father was Jim Bruton, was keeper for, what, about 18 years. So that was a, a really important source, obviously. Absolutely, yes. 
I spoke with Alani the other day. She's got so many good stories. So let's uh, just talk a little bit about the, the early history of the lighthouse, or actually the reason for the lighthouse. Uh, I know there are a lot of shipwrecks in that vicinity, but especially there's a pretty famous one that had something to do with the, the lighthouse being built. Can you maybe say a little bit about that? Sure. The wreck of the SS Valencia is the one that's considered the turning point for a lot of the lighthouses along the Strait of Juan de Fuca and being the impetus for their creation. Mm -hmm. And the Strait of Juan de Fuca is often nicknamed the Graveyard of the Pacific for how many shipwrecks it has on the bottom of the seabed. Uh, but this particular ship left from San Francisco and was headed for Seattle and Victoria. And it severely missed the turn into the Strait of Juan de Fuca because there was no beacon to mark the entrance. And I think it was about 20 miles that the captain had overshot and then turned directly onto a reef. I don't think it's often talked about because usually the horror of the, the Titanic is uh, overshadowing, but... It was described as one of the most horrific, one of the most horrific shipwrecks mm -hmm. of that time because there was only 37 men who survived, none of the women and the children survived, and it was a horrific scene to behold of just everyone clinging onto the wreck as it was getting pulled off of the reef and no one surviving. So after that, there was a commission that then said between the U.S. and Canada, we need a lot more lighthouses on this. Uh, on the strait, and that was how Sheringham came about. The ship, the Valencia was, I'm sorry, what year again did that happen? The Valencia crashed in 1906, mm -hmm. so it was okay. six years before the yeah. Titanic. Right, and six years before the lighthouse was built, right? Yes, construction started in 1910. Back to the, uh, we're talking about the, the keepers. Do you think mm -hmm. uh, Sheringham Point was a, a, a good place to live, a comfortable place to live for the keepers and their families? Donald Graham, you probably know his books. He he called it a plum station, which means you know it was a place that the keepers want would want to be uh, with their families. How do you feel it compares to other places? From what I've been told by the assistant keepers that I've talked to, uh, Sheringham Point was considered a much easier location to live at, just due to the proximity of the station to the town, and that it was not too isolated. Yeah. That you were going to have visitors, that you could have people from neighboring areas that might come visit you rather than being on some island that no one's ever going to come and you see one ship coming in and out with your supplies every couple months. I believe that's what he meant by it was a plum station. Right. Yeah. No, I know there's a lot of very remote lighthouses along the, the BC coast and it makes me think of uh, in the French lighthouse service, they use the, the term traditionally uh, en fer et paradis, the uh, hell and heaven stations. And uh, you have a lot of hell <laughs> stations in BC, but Sheringham relatively would be a, a heaven station, I would say, for, for the keepers. I've never heard that one, but I like that, yeah. yeah. Eustace, that's how you pronounce it, right? Eustace yes. Arden was the first keeper, and he was there for 34 years. That's a, a really long stretch uh, for a keeper to be at one lighthouse. When you uh, think about him, what really stands out for you? Yeah, Eustace is a really interesting character because he was, as you just said, there for the longest amount of time and he probably saw the most development for the station. I mean, he was there when it was originally just a tower and then over time they added the Foghorn Station and additional components to the station. And the other thing is that the Ardens were and still are a very prevalent and important founding family for that area. So... It perfectly ties in with the history of the area that he would be one of that he was the first lightkeeper, and uh, we have a lot of pieces of historical things that came from that family, and so we know a bit more about the stories, and we know and we have all the letters that were sent to the Coast Guard in correspondence, so you can tell a little bit more what their struggles were at the time, like having a road access that was passable, and different kinds of quarrels that they get in with their neighbors and the struggles of keeping livestock versus water access. There's all sorts of things that you see a lot more of the original foundings that the later keepers wouldn't have experienced. Is there anything else that stands out in your mind about the, the other keepers that were there after him and maybe before uh, Fred Mountain, who we'll talk about in a minute, uh, from like the 40s through the 50s? Is there anything else that stands out about them? So between Eustace Arden and, and uh, Fred Mountain, we have Thomas Charles Cross, Alfred Dickinson, and Thomas Westhead. Thomas Cross and 
Thomas Westhead were both Navy men, and Thomas Cross had a rather short stay. He was just there as an interim keeper uh, while they looked for an additional light keeper to replace Eustace Arden. There's not a lot that I could find on Thomas Westhead. The only image I've ever managed to track down of this individual was one of the ships that he made while he was a light keeper, and it was called the Blueberry, and it popped up on eBay for sale. Is is this a model you're talking about? No, it was an actual sailing ship. Wow. It's called the Blueberry. And he had, I believe it was the Strawberry, and there was one other one that I can't remember off the top of my head. But oh, yeah. that was interesting. But I don't know a whole lot about him otherwise. There were some papers that I found in his... There was a secured vault, so to speak. It was top secret, uh, according to the archives. But when I actually went there, it was only uh, letters that he was describing basking sharks that he had seen go by. Hmm. Because at one point there was a bounty for basking sharks wow. in that area. And so he must have been keeping a, an eye out and reporting back to the government. But other than that, I, I don't know much about his time, if there was anything terribly remarkable while he was at Sheringham. Yeah. Um, it's been lost to history. But sure. one of the more interesting characters that I did find quite a bit on was Alfred Dickinson. He's such a character, I wish I knew the full, complete story about him. I mean, I managed to piece through pieces through his military records. He was part of a police force in Ontario. And I found a couple different marriage certificates. So he must have been remarried several times. And when he arrived at Sheringham, he was married to Annie. And he apparently had some rheumatism and other issues from being active in World War One. He was discharged due to aches and pains and fainting and rheumatism and constant back and knee joint pain. But then after... A certain time that he spent at a logging camp in Ocean Falls, BC, he then joined the Lighthouse Service. And he served at three stations with Annie, his wife, at the time. Um, Quatsino being the first, first Narrows or Capilano, and then Sheringham. And what was really interesting about Dickinson was I managed to get a hold through, I believe it was through the estate of Donald Graham, I got a hold of his captain logs and his journals that he kept uh, while he was at Sheringham and that really offered another insight into his experience at the station and he's got some amazing stories about how he just couldn't seem to keep the curtains that surrounded the uh, lens from catching fire they were always on fire according to him even if they were on the ground even if he took them down they were on the ground and they were on fire (laughs) to having some contretons with his assistant keepers who would be going and poaching deer and then he'd think okay i'm gonna go turn them into the rcmp and all sorts of things but what was really lovely about reading through his diaries is he gets there and he seems rather disappointed this is not up to his standards whatever they were and over the time you see this evolution of someone slowly falling in love with the place and he's got it back into a bit better shape and he's happy with it and he's by the end he seems pretty happy with the work he's done there and it's kind of sad to leave and you can't obviously include an entire log book in in a book that you're writing about all sorts of people but for me that was one of the most interesting things to look back and say oh okay well I, somebody really saw a lot of growth at the station it's really really interesting the next keeper after the ones you just talked about was Fred Mountain, who was there 59 to 67. He actually died at the station. Anything other than that that was especially uh, interesting about him? Fred Mountain was a career lightkeeper, and he was at several other stations, and Sheringham was his last. I don't know terribly much about any interesting stories. I think for him it was a very standard and routine posting. There was a story in newspaper clipping about um, getting a sliver of, I think it was metal in his eye, mm. and because they were just a little too far out from anywhere to go get quick medical help, his wife, Nellie, had to pull this out with a pair of sterilized screwdrivers. Oh, man. Wow. And I remember I've spoken to one of his assistants and his wife quite a bit, Mike and Pat Cross, and they are telling stories about how you know you just have to be resourceful and things happen and you just got to keep going and do the best you can and he said that i believe fred mountain said that i believe uh, he said he must be part doctor part seaman and part engineer mm. and he must be able to adapt to the solitude again like alfred dickinson 
he said that he would do it all over again and that he loved the station. So it's another heartwarming ending to yeah. a time of sharing. The my next question maybe maybe relates to Fred Mountain. It's something I have to ask you. You know, you read uh, any uh, any uh, website mention of Sheringham Point. Uh, anything I, I've read about it seems to mention the fact that it's supposedly haunted. And I'm just wondering if you have any comment about that subject. Absolutely. So there's a couple of different theories out there. I unfortunately have yet to experience my own ghost encounter at Sheringham, but there are a couple of theories if it is haunted, who it might be. And I know Walani Bruton believes that Fred Mountain is around and that there's one story that she told that she may have told in your, the interview with you about Fred insisting that a paint scraper be left on the workbench or not be left on the workbench be left on the um, windowsill in the workroom and she was absolutely convinced that he would move this scraper and that he would occasionally walk up and down the hall in the house and there's been a couple of other people who have said things like oh i know i feel like i saw a ghost and there's another instance so annie arden eustace arden's wife actually became handicapped by the end of the time that they were there and she apparently in the old house would be on the top floor and had a bell to say, I need help, come help me. Mm-hmm. And there's been certain people saying, oh, I, I heard Annie Arden's bell ringing from the top. So it's definitely there's room for imagination for sure. <laughs> Another thing that I talked about or, or that Alani Bruton told me when I spoke with her a few days ago she said that her brother actually claimed to have seen a ghostly man in the in the house, and she said she just saw him recently, and they hadn't mm-hmm. talked about her in a long time, and she showed him your book, and he saw the picture of Fred Mountain. He said, oh, yeah, that's who I saw in the house. I don't know if you've heard that, but... Uh, I had not. <laughs> yeah, this is a new story, I think. She said she just saw him recently, so he seemed absolutely wow. sure that that's, that's the uh, the person or whatever you want to call it that he had seen in the, the house uh, quite a few years ago. When I spoke with John Walls of the Society yesterday, he, he uh, told me to look for something on the cover of the book. There's a, a beautiful nighttime photo of the lighthouse with the Milky Way behind it. And there's an interesting light on the front of the, the tower. And you can tell me your take on this, but John said that there was no source of light on that side of the, the lighthouse and that nobody could figure out where that came from. Is that your understanding also? Yes, that was really interesting. I didn't actually know that until we were having the, the official announcement that the book was at the publishers. The artist, Mark, and I believe it was Ian, who's one of our media guys, had were there taking this photo and they said no matter what we did we couldn't figure out where that was coming from and there was no light from behind us and yet every photo we took there was this light on it and they said maybe it's the ghosts maybe it's something a little supernatural so that's very it's interesting pretty neat. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i think the picture there's a picture of the cover of the book on the website on the the sheringham point uh, lighthouse preservation society's website I believe uh, you can buy the book through the website, and I think there's a picture of the cover if people want to see that, what we're talking about. So that is uh, a way people can see that for themselves, but I also recommend they buy the book for themselves and see what's what's inside the book as well. So, of course, as we spoke about a few minutes ago, we, we know a lot about Keeper James Bruton because his daughter, Alani, is very involved with the society, and I just spoke with her a few days ago. Anything that I know there's a lot of a lot of stories about the Brutons, but what really stands out for you about the Bruton family stay at the lighthouse? One of my favorite stories that I ever got from Alani was about her sister Sharon being married in the actual tower up in the lantern room. And she said they managed to squeeze more people than you'd have thought <laughs> up there. And there's these great photos that they couldn't get I don't think they could get the photographer up high enough, so you've got these photos shot up and if you got the copy of the book you'll you'll see these photos yes. it shot up through and you're just able to see as if you were looking from underneath this wedding and that is so neat i mean how often does that happen right yeah i saw that it was such a such a neat and almost fairy tale-esque kind mm-hmm. of wedding yeah. too. lighthouse is a great place to get married they are although sharing them is not open to the public for to go up but i can right. say having climbed those ladders yeah. i don't think i would be brave enough to do that in a wedding dress let alone any dress right right yeah so. yeah good point 
we touched on uh, one or two of the assistant keepers earlier. Anything else about the assistant keepers that stands out? I include the stories of a few of the assistant keepers that I've managed to track down. There is a partial list that is available in the book. The ones that are featured in the book itself include Mike and Pat Cross, Ken and Marion Nelson, Christopher Reader, and Joseph and Vivian Jubb. And I've spoken quite a bit with the Crosses, and they are still active within the Lighthouse community. And one of my favorite stories that Mike and Pat Cross told me was about chasing Mercury around mm. in the lantern room. <laughs> and they, they joked that, you know, nowadays you get really spooked if you see even just a drop of Mercury anywhere, or if there's a possibility of contamination. And they used to have this vat of Mercury up in the lantern room because that was how the lens would rotate with no friction. Yep. But if there was an earthquake, which happens somewhat often up in Strait of Fuca, the mercury might slop out, and so then they'd be running around, chasing the surrounding circles in the lantern room. But it doesn't seem to have done him any harm. <laughs> yeah, and I've heard other stories about lighthouse kids at places that had uh, mercury, like you're describing, for the lens rotation, and the kids playing with it. Moving on to a different subject here, uh, there's a couple of pages in your book that deal with a, a movie that was shot at the, uh, the light station called Stranded, something I never heard of before. Can you uh, tell me uh, what was what was that all about? And is uh, second kind of a part two to that question is, do you know if that movie's available to see in some way? Stranded, I believe it was also called Lighthouse in some of its releases, was a thriller that was filmed at Sheringham, and the uh, cinematographers made it look as if Sheringham was located on some remote island. And it was kind of a scandal for the community around because they brought this film crew in and they filmed this, this movie and then they ran out of funds and ended up bailing without really settling all of their bills around. And so for a lot of people, that was a bit of a, a unfortunate moment for the Lighthouse's history. Um, and... My understanding was that the physical film then got passed around back and forth to a couple different cinematographers and other production companies, and eventually it was sort of restitched together to tell a slightly different story than the one that they had initially come up with. And it was released, but I don't think it managed to do like terribly well. I don't think it was in a box office or anything. I think it probably went straight to VHS. And I only managed to find a copy of it. I found two copies of it in European formats mm. on eBay. And so I had them digitized. And that's how uh, in the book, I managed to get some screen grabs from that, that digital copy that I made. But what was kind of interesting was they were actually pretty involved with the light keepers during this production. At the time, it was Kurt and Marika Seahack who were manning the station. And they'd have them changing the lenses and the light so that it had different colors. And they were using the actual house that the keepers were living in and they were fitting it so that it looked like it had two stories instead of one and putting shutters on and putting fences in. And they said it was absolutely fascinating to be living on the set of this movie. So another interesting story about the movie that um, I don't think is featured in the book, I don't think it made it into the final photos that were included, was there's a scene at the end where the bad guy leaps from the lantern room and plunges to his death at the in the rocks. But they had hired a stunt double for this shot, and apparently the they set out this huge pillow at the base of the tower that he was aiming for, and the, the pillow went right to the edge of the rocks. And this man apparently was so freaked to do this shot that he was throwing up and so nervous, and in the end leapt, and he said he landed two feet from the edge of the pillow uh. on the rock. <laughs> absolutely nerve-wracking i can't imagine doing that having walked around there i think he was probably a little shaken for a couple hours <laughs> I, would bet, I would guess so wow what in particular about sheringham point lighthouse why, why should it be preserved i think there's a couple reasons um that sheringham point and lighthouses should be preserved for me one of the things that pops into my mind initially is when you think about Canadian history particularly on the west coast I think a lot of first nations history pops into my mind but there are certain things that won't last like you see these beautiful totem poles but they are eventually eroded by nature taking its toll 
and the lighthouse towers i think are a similar beacon of culture and history and you know if they're not maintained they too will go the same way and here you have an opportunity to save another piece of history in the canadian story i think that it was incredibly important especially for the community around that sharing and be saved because it effectively was one of the central points that formed the community around the station and there's something magical and hopeful about lighthouses they're a, a beacon of hope for a lot of people and they're very romanticized and they also <laughs> as corny as it sounds they are a good tourist location they will bring some amount of economic draw to the the community around i mean we have several locations nearby that are named after either the sharing point lighthouse or they use sharing point as an icon and finally, they're kind of a, a bygone era. They're a holdout from something that we don't really use very very much anymore because GPSs have largely taken over. And they're this piece of history that you have the opportunity to go and see how things once were. And you can walk up and touch it, which you don't get that a lot of times in museums. And to have something that you can walk out of your back door and up the road and suddenly it's there, it's... It's extremely important, I think, for a lot of people and knowing the history of the location. Definitely. That's a lot of good reasons uh, to preserve the lighthouse and, and very well said. So I have one more question for you for bonus points. Okay, so <laughs> get ready. So what's the best thing about your personal involvement with the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Preservation Society? Oh, my gosh. You know, when I started, I, like I said before, I was 16. I think for me, the, the lighthouse was always just this archaic piece of a time gone by that you could go and kind of scrabble through some of the bushes and go and see and it never really occurred to me at the time how much history and how much importance that it had to families in the area it was just this tower that was there and sometimes the coast guard was there as i got more involved i started talking with ilani bruton and the crosses and everyone else that was involved i really gained this appreciation for this world that I would never have known about and to me that was exceptionally rewarding to be able to say okay this is an era this is a chapter that has been closed in Canadian history so to speak but we can keep it alive by writing down the stories and talking to people and sharing it with everyone else and then as sharing and point lighthouse preservation society took over the station it became more from a dream to a reality that it was going to become a passive park and that this was not going to be lost forever, that there was going to be this ongoing piece of history that everyone could come and see. I think that, to me, was the most amazing thing to see, that it's not just this one site that you can visit. It is this entire network of history and people you can see and interact with, and it's, it's amazing stories that you read about, but here it is. It's tangible. Well, you've <laughs> done a wonderful job of recording the, the history of that place and, and sharing it through uh, this book, which again, I, I recommend to people, people who are, you know, maybe in that area who know the lighthouse, but anybody who's a lighthouse buff, I think would, would enjoy the, the book. Is it, I know it's available through the, the website, the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Preservation Society. The website is, is what? It's just sheringhamlighthouse.org. Okay. Uh, Rebecca Quinn, I, I just want to thank you again so much for spending time with me today, and uh, congratulations on the, the book. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. To learn more about the Sheringham Point Lighthouse Preservation Society, go online to sheringhamlighthouse.org. There's a Lighthouse Store section on the website where you can buy Rebecca Quinn's book, Sheringham, A Canadian Heritage Story. I visited Sheringham Point Lighthouse during a West Coast trip in 2015. It was nice to revisit uh, through these interviews. Many thanks to Rebecca Quinn and John Walls and to Alani Bruton for her interview uh, that we heard in the last episode. Check out the U.S. Lighthouse Society website at uslhs.org to see everything the Society has to offer. Next week's episode of Lighthearted will feature an interview with Tim Bailey, a former Coast Guard keeper of Halfway Rock Lighthouse in Maine. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Oh, in my house, I'm gonna let it shine.
Let it shine, let it shine. 